We got it sorted out. There we go. Technical issues. Sorry for the delay, folks. Um, before we welcome our guest, Dr. Michelle Turner of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, I have a couple of announcements, and announcements are going to be short. First off, uh, tours. I know I said in the last stream that we were beginning tours, and internally we've made the decision to, just for now, stick with private tours only. So uh, private tours, you can, you can have a private tour of one person, but you're essentially paying for at least four people per tour, and, and this is really so we don't have groups who don't know each other mixing, um, as well as other safety concerns. So, sorry about those of you who, you know, this really doesn't suit. Uh, you know, I know uh, some individuals, some couples, uh, smaller groups of, you know, two or three want to do this. We would love to accommodate you. Watch our website for updates if there are any changes, but we're also looking out for your safety and the safety of our docents. But again, we are available for private tours, so you can find more information on how to book those on our website. Uh, next announcement is Mesa Talks. So for this month, September, Mesa Talks will be on September 29th at 6 p.m. as always. And Professor Severin Fowles of Barnard College will be, uh, will be the guest speaker for this month's Mesa Talk. So uh, Sev, if you're watching, you're on deck. and. Uh, then, of course, for today, as I said, we've got uh, Dr. Michelle Turner, so uh, let's do our, our intro here and get into it. Um, so I'm here with uh, Dr. Michelle Turner, a uh, postdoctoral scholar, is that correct, with the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center? Yes. So uh, welcome to the stream, Michelle. And uh, from my understanding, well, you know, I've tuned in to some of uh, Crow Canyon's live streams, so I wanted to, you know, first give you an opportunity to uh, talk more about those, uh, how you're involved, and uh, what might be coming up. Yeah, so we have uh, been doing webinars every Thursday for pretty much uh, the whole pandemic. Um, they're incredibly popular. We've been reaching out to people all over the world and all over the country. So we're going to keep doing them, it seems like. Um, they're every Thursday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, next week, we have a really cool one. Uh, Chris Guterman from, um, let's see, somewhere in Arizona. <laughs> uh, he's going to be talking about the origins of beams, the wood, wooden beams from uh, Chaco Canyon and Aztec ruins. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, I'm giving a webinar, a more expanded version of the talk I'm doing today uh, on October 7th. And you can see the program on our website, crowcanyon.org. And all of the old webinars, most of the old webinars, are actually recorded, and you can see them on our YouTube page. Wonderful. And um, so our audience is about to get like a, a sneak preek, almost like the, uh, the premiere of the, the single hit that you're about to do, right? That is absolutely right. Never before seen. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we dive into that one, though, you've, you've also got uh, another paper uh, that seems to be, is it in press right now? It's out. It's in a book. Yep. It's in a book. Okay. So I'm really interested in this one, but, but sorry, I haven't had a chance to read this. Uh, this is on the uh, ancient aliens theory. Uh, <laughs> do you want to talk about that for a moment? Yeah. So I co-authored this chapter with uh, my husband, who is a philosopher of science. And this is sort of a philosophical analysis of ancient aliens theory, how it works as a conspiracy theory, but also it's, it's racist and ideological roots, um, the denial that indigenous people around the world could have done these things that, um, you know, people are claiming were done by aliens instead. Uh, it's, it's pretty heavy philosophy in parts, but also some archaeological analysis. So, uh, yeah, it's out. Um, the book is kind of expensive, so if anyone really wants to read it, you could probably get in touch with me and I could send it. 
Um, yeah, uh, I, I know you follow me on Twitter. Um, I don't know if you've seen how many times I get into flame wars over these things. Uh, people arguing like, oh, you can't drill a hole in stone without machinery. And <laughs> right. It always seems to be the machinists who have opinions on these things. <laughs> right. You know, people had amazing engineering technology in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like a, a history of the Industrial Revolution would actually, like, help some of these people understand more of reality. Right. I also but, find it really hard as an archaeologist. I don't know about every archaeological site around the world, and these folks always seem to have an example from Egypt and one from Indonesia. And I'm like, I'm sure the archaeologists there understand exactly how that was made, but I probably can't tell you that today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you on that. But... Honestly, between the, these Twitter flame wars and, and then um, in, in a less contentious setting, doing news stories and uh, on this stream, I feel like I'm becoming a better archaeologist because I'm becoming more acquainted with the, the archaeology around the world. And of course, the uh, the webinar series that Crow Canyon's been presenting has also really helped me get an understanding of topics that I'm not an expert in. Right. Yeah. No, we've had a lot of opportunities to watch a lot of videos about archaeology all over the world yeah all right so um i want to not take up more of your time here and uh hand it over to you to uh um get into uh what's the this topic and um i i, I think uh this is an outgrowth of your dissertation research right nope this is totally new research this is to totally new research all right yeah. so so tell our audience okay let me go ahead and share my screen am i on you're on. All righty. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to get to talk to you today. This is um, research that I've been working on since I got to Crow Canyon uh, about two years ago. Um, and it's totally new. I have not actually publicly talked about it at all at this point. Uh, and I've been spending most of the past few weeks actually writing the report, uh, summarizing the research that we've done. And I'm not quite to the point where I have lots of big ideas or interpretations. So a lot of this is going to be just data and cool things that we've uh, found, um, putting it together sort of for the first time. Um, let me begin by um, talking about where I am. So I'm, I'm at Crow Canyon in Cortez, Colorado. And the site I'm going to be talking about today, the Wallace Great House, is here in Colorado as well. So I do want to start by acknowledging that this work is being done on the ancestral lands and territories of the Hopi, Zuni, Pueblo, Ute, Apache, and Diné people. Um, research. Uh, so the Wallace Great House is part of the Northern Chaco Outliers project. Crow Canyon is actually excavating another site that is very nearby Wallace. I'll show that to you in a minute. Um, and Wallace is on private property. We are not excavating it, but it is owned by Dr. Bruce Bradley and Dr. Cindy Bradley, who are both archeologists. They've been excavating at Wallace for over 50 years. Uh, and they have just a huge assemblage of artifacts and um, needed some help with it. And we were really excited to get a good look at that assemblage and to include that in this work that we're doing on the site as a whole. Uh, on the community as a whole. All right, let me show you what I'm talking about. So we're calling this the Lakeview community. There's a reservoir. It's not actually a lake um, that, that would have been there in the past, um, but it is a place that was kind of probably pretty wet in the past. So that's interesting. Uh, on the left here, I've got a map. So we're looking, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but we're looking at the four corners region there and that uh, crescent shape is sort of what we call the Central Mesa Verde region, and the arrow is pointing at the Lakeview community, which is what I'm talking about today. On the right, there's a, a sort of a map of the Lakeview community. Uh, the Haney Great, site, Great House site is on the uh, sort of upper right, right here. And then I've circled Wallace, which is right down below. Um, it's about 300 meters away. It's very close by. Haney has two great houses, both of which seem to be from the Chaco era. Wallace is a Chaco era great house, although with possibly earlier and later components. And then Ida Jean over to the left, 
uh, is the third community, the third great house within this community. This is a multi great house community. That's the thing I want to emphasize. There aren't a lot of those. Uh, Aztec ruins is one example. There's another um, community up here in this area that, that has multiple great houses, uh, Mitchell Springs. Um, but this is a really unusual kind of place where there's multiple great houses. So today I'm going to focus on Wallace. Um, Crow Canyon archaeologists are working at Haney. That's going to be a multi-year project before we start getting these kind of summaries of, of the whole project. Um, but that's that's where we're at. The area, um, like I mentioned, is a really good good place for farming. It's a farming area right now, but it was in the past as well. Uh, one of our interns over the summer, Jeremy Grunvig, actually created uh, a poster that looked at the entire watershed. And what he found is, um, so the, the little circle here at the bottom of this image is, I believe it's Haiti. Um, and as you can see, there are all these tributaries, like five different major tributaries that sort of collect there. Now, I'm not, we're not talking about rivers, we're talking about a watershed. So when it rains, this is where the water goes. Um, so this, this seems to have been a place where, where farming would have been really quite possible and uh, successful. Uh, we're still working on our maps. This one's a little hard to see, I think, but let me, um, so the blue line in the middle is where water we think would have happened in the past, uh, Simon Draw. And as you can see here, Haney and Wallace are actually on opposite sides of this waterway. There's not water there today. Um, my colleague, Colin Throgmorton has actually done a ton of work sort of looking at old maps and looking at old aerial photos and trying to figure out where that draw might have been uh, in the past. And so he's sort of reconstructing this. I think it's super interesting that there probably was water right between these two great, house, uh, great houses. Um, there are several Pueblos today that are on, that have a river running through the center of the community. I think that that might be kind of what's going on here. And obviously also, uh, symbolic meanings as well as you know, just having water right nearby. So the Wallace site as a whole um, includes the Great House, which is here in purple. The, uh, as I mentioned, the Bradleys own this site, but there is another little site there that's actually super interesting. And I've got it highlighted in green to the left of the Wallace Great House. And that little site is called Greenstone Pueblo. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it today. It seems to be sort of a, a unit Pueblo, a small house site, if you will, but it's actually turned out to be super interesting uh, in what we're finding there. So the research questions, these are questions for the whole Northern Chaco Outliers project, uh, but also for what I'm doing here specifically with Wallace. Uh, we're trying to understand the dates of these sites, first of all. We're trying to understand Chaco and connection. So we're up here in Southwest Colorado. It's pretty far from Chaco, uh, but it's pretty clear from what we're finding that there are connections and we're trying to understand, you know, how great houses here um, are similar or different to the great houses in Northern New Mexico um, that maybe a lot of us are more familiar with. Uh, we're trying to understand human environmental relations like those reconstructions of the, the past environment that we've been working on. Uh, social stratification, equality, inequality, are there elites here? What's going on with that? The role of community centers and public architecture and also identity formation, communities of practice. Can we see people making pottery that's similar at different sites, for example, that kind of thing. I don't know that I'm gonna answer all of these questions in the next uh, 20 minutes, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I'll, I'll hit some of them, I think. Um, so our analysis uh, has been a lot. We've done a lot of different things. We've analyzed over 13,000 shirts from Wallace and another 2,000 from Greenstone. We've also looked at a big collection of whole and partial vessels. Uh, this has been an incredible opportunity for me in particular, who have never really looked at whole vessels before to see a big collection and, and to really analyze them. Uh, all kinds of additional, let's see, we've looked at temper, we've looked at, we've done AMS radiocarbon dating on some corn and eggshell from the sites, ornament analysis, groundstone, chipstone, faunal analysis, we sent um, bone 
uh, samples to a specialist to do that. Uh, Archaeobotanical analysis, another specialist. We've also sourced all the obsidian. Lots and lots of things going on um, with Wallace and Greenstone in particular. So this is a, a map of Wallace that was developed by Bruce Bradley, who's been doing the excavating and, and a lot of the interpreta interpretation of this site over 50 years. Uh, by the way, he does have a website uh, that I think you'll probably be able to Google it if you Google Wallace Great House, and he has his excavation reports there, so you can look at those. Uh, I'll try to summarize. Um, so it's, it's a big structure. It was mostly two stories. Parts of it were three stories. And uh, as you can see, different phases. So um, the interpretation is that this central part that's in red is the oldest part. Uh, Bruce actually calls it Old Wallace, and I, I think that fits very well. Uh, built around 1040, maybe a little earlier based on our ANS dates. Um, then phase two is a little green room that was added in the corner. Phase 3A is when most of the rest of the building was constructed uh, around 1120. This little annex that's in yellow was built uh, after 1120 at some point. And then the purple parts are the P3 occupation. So 1180, uh, sorry, 1180 to 1250. Um, they sunk. Uh, P3 kivas into several of the rooms of, of Old Wallace. And there might also be more going on over here uh, on the east wing, or sorry, in the central part of it. Uh, most of the east wing has actually not been excavated. So they're still, they're still working at it. Um, we did do some AMS and radiocarbon dating. Uh, Bruce had originally, in the past, had, had done some tree ring dating. He had some five really good cutting dates and then some other dates. Um, and his architectural phases kind of incorporate that tree ring data. But we had the funding to actually do 25 new AMS dates from Wallace and three from Greenstone, which hadn't been dated at all before. Uh, in general, everything's kind of lining up to Bruce's phases, but we did get some really early dates from Wallace. Uh, two that are probably before 1020, uh, that must be before 1025, and some others that are possibly in the 900s. Um, some of the earliest dates actually are in uh, this rectangular kiva that is clearly a P3 context, but they seem to be reusing cultural deposits because this was corn and eggshell that we dated uh, in this sipatu of this kiva. So some interesting stuff going on there. We also had really early dates at Greenstone, um, possibly in the 900s. Um, Greenstone, I should say, is mostly P2, uh, but it does have this, some, some hints of P1 occupation, and so does Wallace, actually. Um, and we're also finding P1 occupation at Haney, so uh, there's a lot going on with the P1 that is not well understood in this area at this point. Um, latest possible dates, 1260, 1270, I think that might be a little too late, but also it seems like the use changed over time. It was really a habitation during P2 um, and, a, and a community center in P2. In P3, it seems like people are coming from further away to use the site, but not really living there or focusing there. Uh, let's see, this map just shows the, the gray shaded areas are the rooms that we actually analyzed pottery from. Um, a lot of the samples were fairly small, but a lot of them were, were pretty sizable with 13,000 overall. We focused very much on P2 floors and surfaces. So we were trying to see the, you know, at the time that people were really living there, what, were, what, what kind of pottery uh, they had there. And the results, um, I don't know how well you can read this, but overwhelmingly it's a P2 site, but it does have a P3 continuation in the pottery, even though we were focused on the floors. So that is very interesting. We've sort of been surprised by the P1 pottery that has shown up. Um, and I should say, in addition to the floors, we also have samples from uh, an extramural midden. So some of that is reflected in this. And the extramural midden actually matches up really pretty well to what we found in the rooms, which is exciting because it tells you it's not sampling error. Um, and the midden does have quite a bit of P1 in it too. Uh, I don't think that Wallace 
I don't at this point have evidence that Wallace, the architecture at Wallace itself goes back to P1. I think there was probably other stuff nearby uh, and that could use more exploration. Uh, so a big question for me, especially since I am sort of a Chaco archaeologist, uh, was about non-local pottery. We really wanted to see what that Chacoan influence was. And it wasn't what we expected. There was actually not very much Chacoan pottery or non-local pottery in general. We had 60 non-local sherds. It's a small percentage of the assemblage. I should also say we did not look at uh, temper for every single sherd. We looked at it for um, a sub sub sample and then we also you know if we spotted one that looked non-local we would look at temper as well so uh, we aren't necessarily geared to finding every single non-local shirt but i think overall there's not a huge non-local component here uh, what we did have was um, mostly cibola so that's pottery coming from the chaco area uh, Nine of those were Chaco black on white. We also have two Chaco pitchers that I'll talk about in a minute. We had some Chuskin uh, wares, but not very many, again, for four shirts. In contrast to Northern New Mexico, where a Chaco in sight would have 10 or 20 or 30% Chuskin pottery. So this is kind of interesting. There were some uh, redware shirts coming from Arizona, also some Mogollon shirts, including that bowl that's a um, pictured on the upper right. Uh, so overall, not a large non-local assemblage, but the things that are there are really connected to that Chacoan world. Um, in the Chaco world, black pottery like the Smogion uh, bowl is really important. So it's redware. We've got the Chaco pitchers. So I'm, I'm seeing the connections, even though the numbers are small. So one of the kinds of vessels that we found that uh, have been found at Wallace are human effigy vessels. Uh, two examples, and one of them is just this little arm. Um, this is an arm from a, a human effigy vessel, probably pretty similar to the examples on the right. The bottom one is from Pueblo Benito. The one at top is from Aztec West. There aren't a lot of these in, in the world in general, but um, they do seem to be really associated with Chaco at Pueblo Bonito. There were, I think, a few dozen of them, and then they've been found at Aztec, at Bowman, other outliers. Uh, most of them seem to have been made in Chaco. They're uh, Cibola ware. Most of them are Chaco, sorry, Chaco McElmo, black on white, or Chaco black on white. Um, they're beautiful. These faces of, seem like real individuals. Uh, they often have either body paint or tattoos. Uh, they are vessels, so they could hold a liquid. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence on what they might have held. Um, but our little arm from Wallace is super interesting because it is Chuskin. It has trachyte tempers that came from the Chuskin Mountains. And as far as I know, that is the first uh, human effigy vessel that's been identified to have come from uh, the Chuskas although not a lot of them have had a lot of really good analysis. So that was exciting. There is also another human effigy vessel at Wallace that I'm not gonna show a picture of because I'm still working out the context of it. And I, I think it might be kind of a sensitive item. Um, it's, it was locally made, unlike all of these examples. It's a little different. It's, I, you could say rougher. It's a little flask shaped thing. And then the arms and legs seem to have come right off the front of it. It does have a little face. Um, and Bruce actually did some residue analysis on it many, many years ago. And he found evidence, or they found evidence of tobacco and datura in this object. Uh, datura is a hallucinogenic substance. So it seems like it was used maybe for some kind of mind altering um, event, ritual, whatever you want to call it. So that is a very interesting new uh, piece of data about this site as well. All right, I do want to talk about the Chaco pitchers. We were all super excited to see them. Um, and I should mention that these are reconstructed vessels that the Bradleys and their helpers put a lot of effort into reconstructing. Um, they were both made in the Cibola region. We checked the temper on them, so we know that they came to this great house. Um, and they're examples of Chacoan pitchers, which is a drinking vessel form uh, at 
at Chaco that was really, really popular uh, for many centuries. It started before the cylinder vessels came along, which we now know the cylinder vessels are really associated with cacao. Uh, some of the pitchers have also tested as having cacao. We did not test these ones, and I don't think we can because I think they've been washed really thoroughly. Um, but Chaco pitchers seem to have had something to do with cacao as well. And then they went into decline uh, in sort of the post chocolate period and were replaced by mugs. Um, the vessel, well, the vessel number 16, the one on the left from Wallace, looks so much like a vessel from room 28 at Pueblo Bonito, which is the cylinder vessel room. Uh, so that is just one of those things that strikes you. Um, and, it, you know, the Chaco and connections are pretty obvious to me. Uh, just wanted to show these because I love them, the little bird effigies. So each of these would have had a little head sticking off at one point. Those are broken off. Uh, the two on the left are from Wallace um, and they are whole. Uh, the little shirt on the right, we think, was um, a bird effigy vessel as well. I mentioned the red wares from Arizona and just wanted to show an example of these beautiful, beautiful saggy orange wares, um, three different kinds of bowls, three different types, but um, they definitely are into, into red wares as I will demonstrate in a moment with the ornaments. Oh, yes. So uh, overall, you know, red wares, the movement of pottery and the movement of red wares in particular and also Maguillon, and Chacoan wares, uh, that's all very typical of the Chacoan system, time, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I, I am seeing the connections, even though the, the number of shirts is pretty small. Okay. Um, I'm working on a big project on the ornaments. We've uh, analyzed every ornament that came out of Wallace and Greenstone, and there were a lot of them. So Wallace had 245 ornaments. We think that's a lot, even, if, even sort of, um, controlling for how much ex excavation there has been. So uh, 245 total. Of those, 148 of them were either non-local or semi-local materials. Large proportion of shell, also some turquoise, as you can see there, jet, uh, including the little, little jet bird, which I absolutely adore. Uh, jet birds are a thing from Pueblo Bonito as well, so um, more connections right there. Greenstone also has a lot of non-local or semi-local materials, which is maybe not what you would expect from the small house. Um, that picture uh, on the bottom there is a tessera or a little mosaic piece from Greenstone. I don't think it's turquoise, but it seems to be some kind of blue greenstone. We don't find these tessera very often outside of Pueblo Bonito. Um, and at Pueblo Bonito, there were a ton of them. There was actually a cylinder vessel that was completely inlaid with turquoise. Um, not sure if this was something like that or if it came from a piece of jewelry, uh, but it is something special and it came from Greenstone from the little small house. Some shells, lots of shells actually. Uh, we had different species. Uh, I want to point out the spondylus, which is the red. Again, I mentioned red is important at Wallace. Um, there, was, there were three pieces of spondylus at Wallace, which might not sound like a lot, but compared to other sites, it actually is quite a collection of spondylus. Uh, all of these shells came from the Pacific Ocean or from the Sea of Cortez. Oh, and the glycimerous bracelets, those are probably were made in Hohokam and made, made their way up to Wallace. Uh, a lot of them broke and were reused as pendants. They put a hole in it so they could wear it as a pendant. 30% of the ornaments at Wallace are red trying to figure out what exactly that might mean. Color is really important in the ancestral Pueblo world. Um, that's a very different pattern from Chaco where things are mostly white or turquoise and also from Aztec where most things are actually black, most ornaments were black. So um, a lot of this redware actually came from Utah. So the pottery that has been turned into pendants on the, on the left there, a lot of those pots would have come from uh, Western our Eastern Utah. So it's not a really distant connection, but it is what we call semi-local. It's not somebody went and got those things. Um, so maybe it's a connection to the West actually. Uh, and some of them are red dog shale. The ones on the right are red dog shale. 
we also uh, looked at the chipped stone, mostly from Greenstone. We haven't looked uh, real in depth at the chipped stone from Wallace. Most of it is pretty local or semi-local, but we do have some really interesting uh, examples and they're actually all from Greenstone. So Wallace, the, the obsidian, which we had uh, sourced is almost entirely from the Jemez, Jemez Mountains in New Mexico, which is far away, but also it's, it's what we would expect. At Greenstone, however, uh, we had one example from Government Mountain in Arizona. Uh, that's actually the projectile point that's on the, on the far left. Uh, there was one from Idaho, 500 miles away. And that's actually that uh, projectile point that's on the right in the little picture. And then we also had one from Western Utah from uh, Wild Horse Canyon. So these points that I'm showing you here, these are Pueblo II types of points. So they were made in our area. Uh, however, the obsidian came from really far away. And it's super interesting that the the distant obsidian is being found at Greenstone rather than at the Great House itself. All right, so like I said, I, I, I'm just putting the data together at this point. I don't have a ton of interpretation to give you, but um, you know, overall, I'm seeing a lot of non-local materials and connections to Chaco, but it's not necessarily what we would expect at a you know a, a Great House in New Mexico. Um, it's not the huge quantities of, pro of pottery being carried long distances. Instead, it seems to be a few really special vessels, or it seems to be the ornaments, or it's that obsidian that came from long distances. All of that really is pointing to connections to the wider world more generally and to Chaco uh, specifically. Uh, the sites, both sites are mostly Pueblo II, but we are finding a surprising amount of Pueblo I as well. Possibly some of that um, is indicating that there are other habitations nearby. And actually, we did some, um, our field crew did some remote sensing that suggests that there are more habitations nearby. Uh, there is some Pueblo III use of the site. Um, Bruce and Cindy Bradley have had a lot of thoughts about what that use was. I'm, I'm sort of leaving that part to them, but um, it seems not to have been really a main habitation at that point. Instead, the rooms were being filled with, with P3 trash at that point, uh, pottery and, and things from P3 period. Um, we are rethinking the idea of a small house, I think. Greenstone is not where the poor people lived who had nothing. <laughs> they had uh, just as much or even more um, non-local materials there. So what exactly is that relationship between the small house and the great house? Uh, and who are the people in each one of those. And we're working on this multi great house community. So there's a lot of work to be done at different scales, right? Like comparing the multiple sites, understanding this whole community, um, understanding a wider landscape that connects them to Chaco, to Aztec, to Arizona. Um, but then also, there's a lot more work to be done on, on smaller scales. I've sort of given you, you know, an overview of the great house. Now I'm trying to get into rooms and getting into particular floors and, and try to see see what, what we can learn on different scales. Um, just a huge assemblage, a really exciting assemblage. Um, I did want to mention that a lot of this was done during COVID. We actually picked up the, the first shipment of pottery like March 10th, 2020. So we had had it for a couple days when we shut down. So we had to be really creative about how to use it. We were really fortunate to have the grant that we got from the History Colorado State Historic Fund that really kept this going. And the other thing we were really lucky about was that um, this is a privately owned collection and the Bradleys didn't mind us taking sherds home. So a lot of the sherds actually got analyzed at people's houses and that, that's how the work got done. When we did come together, especially for the whole vessel analysis, we did a lot of that at, um, at the Bradley's uh, home laboratory, which is a tiny little room. So a lot of times we actually set up tables outdoors uh, where my colleague Ben and I would sit outdoors and do work on, on whole vessels while other uh, colleagues were indoors and the photography was going on in a separate room. So we had to be really careful and creative, but 
it's so exciting that we were able to finish this despite the disruption, despite not having participants and volunteers on campus the way we normally, that's who normally analyzes a lot of our pottery. So um, this has been super exciting for me and uh, I'm really excited to have gotten to share some of this with you today. Uh, I think that's where I'll wrap up. I should acknowledge all the people who made this happen, including the grant and uh, folks who actually own these materials and let me work on them, and Crow Canyon for hiring me as a postdoc to work on this project. All right. Chester, do you have any questions or are there any sure. questions I should look at? Well, uh, I, I personally certainly have some questions and okay. um, I don't see any in the chat yet, so uh, okay. maybe by the time I get done asking, um, here, let me... Uh, let me let me switch to the view of your face <laughs> or, or can okay. you stop sharing oh yeah all right there we go um yeah thank you thank you for sharing that uh exciting new research so when you say choco outliers um you're, you're no longer talking um because your, your dissertation was at aztec ruins right yep so you're talking further north than that i guess my first question is and maybe maybe you addressed this and, and i didn't get to that um uh, are these still connected by the Chaco and roads, or is that unknown? <laughs> uh, it is unknown. There are certainly um, road segments in the central Mesa Verde region, possibly some road segments that, that our field crew has sort of detected bits of uh, within this community, but it's been plowed, it's been farmed for a long time. It's, it's hard to see those here. Um, do I think that there were roads connecting all the way? I, I'm not sure about that. The most northern most, sorry, most northern roads that I know about that you know really connect Chaco to other things are, are at Aztec, Winfield, really. Uh, all right. Um, my, my my next question has to do with um, you mentioned some bird effigies. And uh, in particular, the residues on these bird effigies indicate that people were uh, using them to either prepare or ingest uh, detura and tobacco. Uh, well, that, that was, that was huh? a human effigy. That oh, was that a human was the human. human. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that we have real good residue analysis on the birds. Okay. Um, it just reminded me of the uh, ritual preparation vessel for. Um, for Datura in the Great Basin was, uh, it was a small basket, but at times it would be referred to as a quail and sometimes, but not always, could take on the form of a quail. But if it's not, if it's not a bird effigy, then maybe I'm making too much of a leap here. Well, I think we don't know and I, I would not be surprised actually, but that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing that. And then um, this is another question you might have already got to, uh, but you showed some examples of Olivella and, and did I see a piece of abalone too? Yep. Uh, are there any indications of connections with the California coast for those? Or are they coming oh, from yeah. a different zone? No, they, they, different species. We know, I don't know personally, but archeologists know where those species are most common. And we're talking Southern California and the Baja Sea of Cortez area. So those came from a long ways away, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I've taken more notes than that, but uh, I think uh, we, could, we can actually move into our uh, news stories unless there's, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Um, so our, uh, our first news story is going to be a topic that uh, uh, we think that fans of Mesa Prieta are, are going to be excited about, and I assume fans of Crow Canyon as well. Uh, this would, of course, be uh, cave art. So uh, this was an, uh, an article that was, um, so uh, Science Friday, which is a uh, weekly podcast by NPR, they do, um, they cover recent topics in science, and they covered this recent paper in the journal PLOS One about uh, experiments on how Paleolithic caves were lit for the people to, to actually make the images and then thus how uh, how would people experience but the image itself and, and the, the process of making it 
they went into a lot of detail in this one, which I think is really interesting because, uh, you know, for example, they experimented with the uh, lighting differences between having a, an open or pit fire versus a, uh, a, a torch of a sort of a, a bundle of pieces of wood uh, versus an oil lamp. And they actually found uh, that oil lamps were being used in the Paleolithic, which is really striking to me. Uh, that that's much earlier than I would have personally uh, expected, um, and it it doesn't really give that bright of a light. So, yeah, it, let's, let's show the audience the uh, there's the oil lamps. Um, <laughs> sorry, Michelle, you can't actually uh, see what I'm showing, uh, but I just I just picked these images out of the uh, plus one article. Um, uh, so that I mean, this was a fantastic study, and uh, one of the methods that they used was 3D modeling. Um, I'm not sure how many of our viewers know that uh, I have used 3D modeling for uh, petroglyph sites in the, the Mojave Desert. Um, of course, uh, viewers have seen uh, my 3D models of some of the panels here, but the example that I'm showing is actually from another region. It actually features this cave-like space with a natural bench, as well as the petroglyphs are a, a little bit faint here. Um, but you can actually use the lighting, um, artificial lighting within in the software that animations like this are made in to change how those would be viewed, um, and how those would be experienced. And that's exactly what these, these folks did. So, I mean, the methods are uh, a topic that's near and dear to, uh, to my heart. And um, it sounds like, Michelle, you have some experience with 3D modeling as well? Yeah, actually, as part of this project, and we're not talking about caves, but uh, we've been doing photogrammetry, so 3D modeling of all of the whole vessels from Wallace and Greenstown. Um, and our, our methods are pretty low tech. We're really just taking pictures, hundreds of pictures of each vessel and then stitching them together with software. Um, some of them turn out better than others and lighting is a big part of it. <laughs> we've, been, we've been doing that. Oh, yeah. Um... The, I, I've definitely struggled getting some models together and, and, and sometimes like lighting just, just throws it off. Um, yeah. I'll have to talk with you some- say, I was I was yeah. so struck at, by the, the story in Science Friday that they were talking about sort of the, the experience of being in a cave with only these kinds of lights. And he was describing sort of how everything moves. It's so magical and the animals are moving and, and the color isn't what you'd expect. And I, I really appreciated that human uh, experience of, of cave art. Absolutely. Um, it, uh, uh, I would say ditto, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it, the, the appreciation justice. Um, I, I think you captured um, the the words that a lot of us would like to share very, very well there. Um, so from, from Paleolithic caves to somewhat more recent caves, this is a, a, I think it's kind of a fun story about a Saxon hermit king. So this guy, if I uh, can check my notes here, uh, he's known as St. Hardolf, but was previously King, er uh, king Erdwulf which for uh, those of us who took Anglo-Saxon for our foreign language requirement, um, Erdwolf, <laughs> um, Erdwolf means uh, wolf of the land or wolf of native soil. Um, so he, he was very much considered to be a local king until he was deposed. And um, uh, the, uh, the Saint Hardolf seems to be a change, uh, a play on that, that wolf part but more going to uh, actually the root of, of the word hard. Like he, he has endured something that's very hard, um, possibly being deposed, possibly being exiled to this, uh, this cave. Um, the, the authors noted that he would have probably had a few uh, disciples with him and that the cave was uh, later modified in the, uh, the 18th century. Um, did you wanna, uh, did you have any comments on this one or did it remind you of anything? Well, I just had a lot of questions about this one. It, it wasn't really clear what the evidence for this is. So, you know, I always appreciate speculative sort of theorizing. I also want to see some evidence. Um, 
it was it was interesting. I, I was also really struck by the fact that the archaeologist who's doing this like normally works abroad, but because of COVID, he can't do that. So he decided to, to dabble in Anglo-Saxon archaeology. What what did you think about it? Um, well, I mean, you, you brought up some important questions, and, and I can I can certainly field some of those. Of course, this is outside of my area of expertise, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you're right. His evidence is a little bit shaky um, because the cave was modified in the 18th century. There's not a lot of the, the original marks. And so his argument is that because the substrate is sandstone, it wouldn't have formed as a natural cave and thus had to have been dug out. Um, and I, I've definitely seen sandstone caves, <laughs> um, the, maybe not as common as limestone caves, but there are certainly processes which, which can create them. Um, but then the other line of evidence was this uh, oral tradition connecting the site uh, with uh, St. Saint, Saint Hardolf. Um, so it, it was sort of that combination, but yeah, I, I agree. It's a yeah, and tenuous. caves are notoriously hard to, to date or, you know, things, things don't get buried in caves necessarily the way they do elsewhere. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah okay, so our... Uh, our uh, next story, you know, proof, proof remains, <laughs> it remains unproven. Um, uh, but our, uh, our next story would be the, uh, oh, oh, that's right. I don't have uh, an image for this one, but uh, evidence of, uh, evidence of post-contact resistance at uh, Mainawa is terrible, uh, Tlatelolco which is in the, uh, the Valley of Mexico. Um, and so I, I read the, uh, the English language briefing on this one. The uh, release, uh, the, the study was done by the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia. Uh, e, e, e Sorry, my Spanish is terrible. Um, we just call them INA here. And uh, they're, they're a government agency that, that oversees these things. We don't really have a, an equivalent here in, in the United States, but uh, INA manages archeological sites and, and oversees investigation, pretty much all archeological projects in Mexico. And um, so, yeah, this, this was interesting because uh, they were doing a study uh, on a city state and found evidence of uh, earlier pre-Columbian monuments that had been buried being reused um, but sort of like the, uh, the instance of the, the hermit king, uh, uh, yeah, King Erdwolf, um, I, I, don't, I didn't see quite enough evidence to really convince me in this one. I don't know if you, if you have an opinion. Um, maybe there's more they haven't shared yet. Yeah, this seemed like a really brief summary. Uh... I was super interested, though, in the human figurines that they talked about in this little summary, um, and with the idea that things change meaning over time, <laughs> that things that, you know, were buried at one point, it sounded like, maybe get resurrected and have a whole new meaning now that, now that you've been conquered by the, the Spaniards and are sort of developing this syncretic, uh, you know, hybrid religion that takes in these ancestral objects uses them in a whole new different way and of course I have human effigies on the mind as well because of the research I'm doing um, so the meanings of those um, I found it very interesting just for that and of course color that they're they're using pigments uh, as, a, as a form of I don't know worship or <laughs> part of the ritual that surrounds these objects yeah yeah um, I, I think this is something that I, I've been uh, anytime that I do talk about the petroglyphs here, I try to um, emphasize that, you know, these things weren't just made and then sat there, that they, they had a social life and that their meaning may have changed over time. And, um, of course, then the, there's uh, some parallels with the, with the Pueblo Southwest with uh, post-contact resistance, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to check the chat, but I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat. Um, so, uh, do you have any, uh, closing comments, Michelle? Um, I guess I would just like to thank you for the opportunity to do this and to sort of finally, finally share the data. Um, 
and it's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, You're right. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, be sure to join us again uh, next month, second Friday of the month. Uh, we'll be back to our regular time, 2 p.m. Uh, but um, thank you everyone. And, and uh, thank you everyone who is going to tune in um, and, and catch the replay. We'll see you next month. And uh, yeah, I'm out. <laughs>